What hobby is an instant red flag? Story 1. Someone on Hinge asked what my hobbies are, and there are a lot, so I listed them out to the best of my ability. She was really happy that I didn't say I was into board games. I forgot board games. So I told her that I am into board games, actually, and she ghosted me. Probably for the best. She doesn't sound very fun to spend time with. Board games are awesome. There was a post a while back about what things are in a golden age, and board games were at the top. Crowdsourcing and 3D printing changed everything for board games, and it's true. There are a lot of board games out there that are all just fantastic. A lot of new and nice gameplay mechanics and a lot of fun concepts and boards. Card games and dice games are up there too, man. There are some outstanding card games today. Many of these games aren't even 20 years old, but board games are enjoying an era of prosperity similar to indie video games. Why the larger producers didn't invest in new and fun games for years is beyond me, but apparently they thought Hot Topic Media tie-in Monopoly and Risk were worth the money. Seriously, who needs a Monopoly using Marvel or DC or Jurassic Park or Star Wars skins with maybe tiny variations in gameplay? It's still Monopoly. If I already have one, I'm not going to buy the other. Crowdsourcing and 3D printing were definitely big recent accelerators, but it's not the main reason we're in a golden age. Much of the reason could be attributed to the emergence of designer board games in the 90s and 2000s that veered from a lot of the classic tropes of past family board games. Catan, Carcassonne, Dominion, Pandemic, Lord of the Rings, Staple Trading Card Games, Pokemon and Magic, Bonanza, also pretty much anything by Reiner Knizia. These weren't the first to avoid those awful classic trends. Elimination in a long game, roll to move slash win, little real agency, ultra bland presentation, etc. But they were the first to normalize it and become super popular, and the standard for it. Catan was probably the big turning point it becoming the new hot game on the level of Monopoly, Risk, Sorry, Clue, Scrabble was huge for the medium and opened the floodgates for so many to the hobby. Story 2. My friend told me after like 8 months of knowing her that she goes out into the woods and collects animal carcasses to process into art, uses acid to melt off the skin and pose the skeleton, makes pelts, etc. I was shocked that she had kept such an awesome hobby secret for so long. My brother said it's because it makes her look like a psycho and that boiling bodies is a serial killer's hobby. I love this because it's the kind of thing that you can compliment a friend on for being cool and beautiful and unique, but also use it to take shots at them whenever you get the chance. You can text them out of the blue and say, saw some roadkill today and it made me think of you. Hope you're doing alright. I used to live in a frat house where we had a standing policy that open liquor left out was fair game. It was never a problem until possibly the dumbest roommate I ever had decided to mix up a couple of orange-scented cleaning solutions in a triple-sec bottle, then left it out on the beer pong table when she was done with it. Naturally, one of my fraternity brothers took a big old swig as he walked into the room to help prepare for the party, then immediately hits his knees, screaming. I took him to the hospital, and he ended up being okay, but I still sent him stock images of the specific brand of cleaning solutions that was the most problematic part every six months or something. Story 3 as a DJ, I don't tell women I DJ until I know she actually likes me. Always seemed douchey telling women I DJ because most DJs are douchey. I think it's the lack of career prospects in future part that turns women off. Not that they think DJs are douchey, even though 50-50 DJs are douchebags that were cool in high school and college and have nothing going on for them now that everyone left and stopped needing them for parties. The problem isn't that DJs are douches, it's that people that make a singular aspect of themselves their entire personality are douches. DJ definitely falls under that category, but sports dorks, stand-up comedians, finance bros, car people, and hunters are all just as bad. I have an old friend named Tanner that started DJing a handful of years back. At this point, he's probably been asked if he goes by the name DJ Tanner well over a hundred times already, and he still doesn't get why so many people ask him that. By the way, the answer is no, he doesn't. Wasted opportunity. Yeah, I DJed in college and opened for a lot of touring acts. Always kept that a secret when meeting girls I was actually interested in. My buddy, on the other hand, thought it was a good wingman move to introduce me as a DJ and list off acts I've opened for every time I talk to a girl. He didn't realize all it did was flag me as someone who could be used for backstage access and easy Instagram clout. 
Yep, it's the last thing I talk about with someone. I have a single picture of me DJing on my dating profiles, which hasn't had an impact on matches, but I never talk about it unless they bring it up or until it's the last thing on the list, lol. It's the modern day equivalent of me and my band are just waiting for our big break. For me, it's a hobby. I have a successful IT career that a potential partner is probably wanting to know more about. People want to see you have something solid going on in your life and not rely on a pipe dream. Story 4 I've heard a lot of people say that horse girls are crazy. One of my best friends starting from high school was a horse girl. We stayed close friends up until she got married when we got around 30 years old. I met up with her for lunch one day and casually told me she tried to stab her husband in a fit of rage. I never knew she had it in her. What made her flip her lid, you may ask? She married a horse trainer and he accidentally hurt her horse one day. Those vet bills would drive anyone insane, I imagine. I've been to a horse clinic once in my life. It was a weekday at like 9 p.m. and in 30 minutes there were like three horses that arrived. Apparently, it was colic season, which is followed by hoof ulcer season, which is followed by some other season, and then it is colic season again, but for other reasons, and all of it is expensive. Hell, we were there for a colic. They gave it an injection and then just waited for the horse to cure itself, and that cost thousands. Unless you get sued by the crazy horse girls, you can probably make a lot of money as a horse vet. Humans have been screwed over by evolution a great deal. Our mouths are too big, edit, too small, for our teeth. Our appendices have a nasty tendency to get infected and burst. And that's not even getting into all of our spinal problems, but at least we're not horses. What I heard, in a bit more explained way, that seems to make sense, many horse girls grew up in a rich enough household to be able to afford horses and a stable, etc. On top of how much time doing horse stuff will take from her time and how attached they are to their animals. I heard a quote that was along the lines of, As her boyfriend, you will never matter as much as her horses or daddy's money. Story 5 Doing pranks for content. Oh my god, I always hated pranks, even back in the day when they weren't just downright mean. But the worst are the ones who prank their kids. The fact that these pranks channels have millions of subscribers makes me lose faith in humanity. Here's a fun fact. The brother of North Korea's leader was killed by two women who thought they were doing a prank video. They were misled by operatives from North Korea who had them combine the ingredients of poison and expose them to the victim's face. I'm basically surprised daily that more content pranksters haven't been shot or at least assaulted by now. I can't say I'm not rooting for that to happen. Like, I don't want them to die, but some of these folks really need to get punched. 100%. I remember back years ago, prank videos on YouTube used to be pretty decent as they were normally roommates or similar and the pranks were fairly harmless. There was also a good chance they weren't staged either, at least at first. However, it then moved into more and more extreme pranks. Then they started involving children who lacked the ability to understand what was happening or why their parents were suddenly being so mean to them. Not to mention that no child is going to magically be okay with it once you utter the it was just a prank line. Then of course, you got into pranking total strangers, which is just messed up as you've no idea what the person is going through at that moment and of course, all the staged stuff. Story 6. A lot of folks here seem unclear about what constitutes a hobby. How so? A hobby is an activity a person does for fun that either gives them peace and joy or feel less stress or tension. Just because you don't enjoy chasing kids to a dark alley doesn't mean it's not a hobby. Albeit immoral and borderline illegal, but it's still a hobby for some psychopathic Redditors. Yeah, I sometimes have to argue that travel is my hobby. People ask what I mean. Simple. A sub $400 plane ticket to almost any country's capital city and several days to roam and explore is the best use of time that I can think of. It's pure bliss. The culture, architecture, food, the sense of exploration and wonder, etc. Are we gatekeeping hobbies now? Being really into making tea or coffee is a hobby at some point. If you have a simple cup of coffee every morning, it's not a hobby, it's a drink. If you spend 10 minutes making a high tier cup of espresso and know all the science of a perfect brew, it's a hobby. If you play Monopoly once a year, board games aren't a hobby. But most who say it is a hobby are talking about the thousands of other more expensive and complex games out there that the majority have never heard of. They play them more than just once a year when the family is visiting. If you randomly pick up coins and throw them into a jar, it isn't a hobby. If you grade them, categorize them, put them in a display, know their histories, etc., your hobby is coin collecting. So what's your definition of a hobby? 
Here's the actual definition, an activity done regularly in one's leisure time for pleasure. So if they enjoy it and do it regularly, it can be a hobby. Story 7. Not particularly a red flag, but sneakerheads always give me the irks. I can't pinpoint why though. Collecting stuff out of interest is fine, but I think sneakerheads often just follow a trend. To me, they feel like the kind of person who brags about their expensive stuff even though nobody in the room thinks it's impressive. The other side of the coin is handbag collectors. I've never met anyone with more than like two fancy slash designer bags that weren't extremely vain and materialistic, even compared to other expensive hobbies like traveling or watch collecting. Maybe it's a small sample size. My only issue with sneakerheads is that it is one of the very few hobbies where I can't figure out what makes one object cooler than another. A few years ago, I bought a pair of new shoes and had several sneakerhead friends of mine compliment me on them, and I was very confused because I'd gone out of my way to buy the blandest, most boring sneakers in the entire store to wear at work. They looked, to me, like something that my grandfather would wear to mow the lawn. It's art. It's whatever you like and what speaks to you. It's multifaceted. If you like a certain color or a certain style, then wear it. There's so much for everyone, and it's wildly inclusive. If you want the super exclusives, then get the exclusives. If you want something cool and fun, then get the cool and fun ones. Story 8. I knew someone online who would troll people online. They'd seriously get a kick out of going online and just saying controversial things just for funsies. There are trolls who turn it into an art form. Then there are people who antagonize people because they derive joy from causing others distress. The former I can appreciate. The latter is sadly doomed to spend their adulthood online with like-minded folk who complain endlessly about how people are too sensitive nowadays and nobody can take a joke. No, we can take jokes. The problem is their jokes aren't funny. Their ceaseless pursuit of a specific brand of humor and one-upmanship leads them to internalize the things they say and escalate beyond the breaking point. My nephews are getting into YouTube videos promoting antisocial behaviors like deliberately winding up their friends on Minecraft until they rage quit, thinking it's the height of comedy to upset someone so much they have to leave. No, that's… you don't teach kids to do that. But these YouTubers don't care. Their target audience is young, impressionable children. I did a group project with a weird guy in class during my junior year of high school. This was in 1999. He asked if I wanted to see something cool. Fired up AOL. That's what we used back then, and started IMing people. I recognized most of the screen names as other classmates, and it became pretty clear that they thought they were talking to someone else. We didn't have a name for it back then, but he was showing me that he was catfishing girls in our grade. That was his hobby. That was the cool thing he wanted to show me. Had a friend who started dating someone new. He and his new girlfriend would sit down and troll people together, like it was a shared hobby. It's a completely alien source of entertainment to me. I don't get it, but weirdly I was like, huh, they seem perfect for each other. Then once the marriage was sealed, she pulled off the mask. He's still a bit of a troll and likes to stir the pot. I'm pretty sure she is a ticking time bomb before she jumps the counter at the local Chinese food joint and assaults the staff. Story 9. An answer I get a lot is, I like to chill. Granted, it's not all of the time, but most of the time, that's just code for I have no hobbies. Tends to be people who expect you to entertain them. Sometimes it's code for smoking weed until I'm in a vegetative state, is my whole personality. Been me for a year, mainly because I moved in with two friends who are like this. I've been having a lot of reflection in the past few weeks, and want to distance myself from them. It's weird though, because we are on good terms, but I gotta tap into my creativity, and it gets hindered when I come home to want a bowl and a show. Not their fault, but I have a lack of control, so I've decided to quit weed as a way to deter this situation from happening. I started with gaining confidence in myself so that I could become a creator in my life. Same here. I quit because of the same situation exactly. Smoked a few bowls the past few days, and I can already feel the old tendencies coming back. Sometimes I forget why I don't go back so it's a good reminder. There are people, especially in America, who work 40 plus, 60 plus hours a week in grueling jobs where they're always on their feet, not allowed to sit, get paid minimum wage, which is not a living wage, don't get any health care, and there's no one at home to help with the chores of life. So when they get precisely rare downtime, literally doing nothing is a golden luxury to them. It's not a sign of laziness or lack of initiative. Cut them some slack. Story 10. Probably not having hobbies. Everyone should have something that they strive for and that makes them happy to put in the effort. You're not a bad person if you have no hobbies, but I bet you're not as happy as you could be either. Sleep is not a hobby. 
eating shouldn't be a hobby. Researching, mapping, and touring local or exotic restaurants could be though, and so is cooking. My ex had zero hobbies. It became exhausting to be with her because she was constantly looking to me to entertain her. When we were off work or both done with work for the day, she was glued to me. If I wanted to do something I enjoyed that she did not like or could not participate in, then she'd complain. So I was stuck in a constant state of trying to find things we'd both enjoy. We were together for three years. When we broke up the next day, it felt like a huge weight was lifted off my shoulders. No hobbies are definitely a red flag. This is so exhausting to deal with. When I met my wife and found out she was a gamer, I felt like I hit the jackpot. Now I can finally enjoy doing my own thing and be in a relationship while she's busy gaming. In every past relationship, my exes needed constant validation and attention. I really enjoy gaming myself. My girlfriend was always cool with it, as I'd only ever play after she had gone to sleep. Once we had kids, things changed a bit. She said she always thought I was a loser for playing video games. She said I was a video game addict, even though at that point I would play a couple of hours a week tops. She even smashed my PS5 controller. What sucks is I had spent who knows how many hours watching stupid Bravo shows with her because she enjoys them. I'm not exactly sure where I'm going with this, just venting I guess. My ex and I used to play video games together for years. Then he decided that unless your hobby was also a side hustle, it was just a waste of time and money. We were not in a financial crisis, but he started thinking that everything in our lives should somehow be profitable. I still love gaming and hope to find someone who does too one day. It's profitable for my mental health and quality of life. Story 11. Cockfighting. It's so common in the Philippines though. Most of our devoted neighbors to this hobby will literally let their entire family skip meals just so that they can have better money. So here in the USA, rooster fighting is illegal on multiple levels, and yet where I live in South Texas, there are people who are very open about raising and fighting fowl. They wear clothes that advertise it. They advertise it on their trucks, and everyone they know has seen their birds. And all that is technically legal because to get busted, a lawman has to catch you with the birds, the blades, the ring maybe, and the money all in the same place at the same time. These guys just always struck me as jerks. Here in Australia, there was a huge exposure to the dog racing industry and how they're literally using live animals to train dogs and how poorly performing dogs are killed or left to die. The industry got shut down for a few weeks due to public outrage, but money talks and they were soon racing again. So I'll go with dog racing as a red flag. Gambling as a hobby is kind of sketchy in general, but gambling that encourages animal abuse and selling semen for hundreds of thousands of dollars is kind of on another level. Are you just going to sneak in that second part and not explain a bit more? Animals that run fast bring in money by winning races. QED, people want to own animals that go fast. If you have an existing animal that goes fast, you can get more animals that go fast by breeding that fast animal with another fast animal of the same species because of genetics and stuff. Take the two parts above and realize that the people who own race animals aren't necessarily the breeders of the animals. And you get animals whose breeders want to gather the semen of to fertilize their breedable female animals in order to make faster animals to win races for buyers, who will, theoretically at any rate, want to buy the sons of champion race animal to win races for them. So the race animal owners, knowing this, end up selling the semen for a premium. Story 12. I'll probably get downvoted to hell for this, and I'm also really late to the thread, as I've gotten older and met more women in the dating world. Girls who love Disney and actively collect Disney stuff and try to go to the parks a lot. I found they tend to be entitled and selfish. Disney adults. The thing is, I think that enjoying things as an adult, even if they're childish, is just fine. There's nothing wrong with going to Disneyland World or whatever as an adult, just because you want to, or any other fandom, frankly, even if it is kid stuff. But then there are the obsessive types who make it their life, and coercively so. That's definitely red flag territory. This also goes for any fandom, too. Depends on the level people go to. Disney fandom doesn't really need to go that deep to get into that person is weird territory. I've met plenty of people who are deep into Star Wars, anime, manga, Lord of the Rings, the MCU, Pokemon, etc., and most are pretty normal unless they make it their entire identity. But I've never met a single Disney adult that didn't give off the weirdo vibe. My sister is a Disney adult. Sure, I enjoy watching Disney, or at least Pixar movies, as an adult too, but she gets so incredibly defensive if someone doesn't share her love for everything related to Disney. You could just say, I didn't find this one movie particularly enjoyable, and she'd act as if you just kicked her dog into a furnace. What annoys me about them is that they see Disney as the ultimate life experience 
experience of travel and exploration. In my 20s, I scrimped and saved and traveled to places on an extreme budget in order to see parts of the world I normally don't. Back then, with a little finagling and long layovers, I could get to Europe for $700, with hostels, a willingness to sleep on the grass from time to time, and a stomach for cheap food, I could save $100 a month and visit Europe once a year for 7 to 10 days. My idea of seeing huge, breathtaking castles is hopping down the Rhine River between Koblenz and Mainz in Germany. You'll see one every mile or two, and each one is more amazing than the last. I've even slept in one or two. You tell a Disney adult this story and they can't wait to tell you about this one time they saw Cinderella's castle, and this other time they saw it, and that other time. Take the Disney money and go actually see the world. It'll be cheaper and you'll have better stories to tell. When I first started using dating apps, I noticed a lot of women had Disney listed as one of their hobbies. I thought it was something like an, oh, I like watching an occasional Disney movie here or there type of thing. Boy, was I wrong. I met some women who had a season pass to the Disney theme parks, despite us not being anywhere near Florida. All their vacation photos on social media seem to be at one of these Disney properties, too. I'm not judging based on subject matter, since I have hobbies or interests many would deem childish, but there definitely is some something extra with the Disney adults that can be nearly crossing a line sometimes. Story 13. No joke, my college professor used to be close to this gorgeous girl he met at his job, and suddenly she's gone and he never mentioned her again. During a chit-chat, he reveals that she likes to snap pics of animal dung for fun and shows them to her friends, including him. I think the professor is at least as weird. He is talking about students or faculty he is dating to other students. Talk about red flags. If you view college as a bunch of classes you go to for a degree, then yeah, you really don't know anything about your professors. If you're working with them on their research or otherwise working with them beyond lectures and tests, they become mentors and colleagues. Just like in the office, with some, you'll only talk about work, and others you'll hang out with outside of the office. However, the academic office is much more likely to have work, hobbies, and interests all overlap or just flat out be the same one or two things. So yeah, work all day, grab dinner and a beer, and back to someone's place to continue their discussion of which mouse responded with the enzymes. Oh, by the way, this is my wife, husband, girlfriend, etc. They don't like mice, but they're so tolerant of my research. It's not unheard of for faculty to date, and they don't usually share personal details with freshmen, but I definitely developed close relationships with professors where we talked about family slash personal lives. I mean, you get to know a lot of them for three plus years. I also had an intro to a theater professor talking about still being madly in love with his wife to a class of mostly freshmen, heavily implied they were still screwing, and it wasn't as awkward as it sounds. Honestly seemed very genuine, at most a bit too open. For me, it was like, damn, I hope I marry someone that makes me feel like that after 20 years. Messed up if she was a student, especially a freshman, but that's not what their comment makes me think of. Joking aside, it sounded like faculty to me, and likely not anyone in the same department if they disappeared after breaking things off. Small chance it's screwed up, but it's a university, not a high school, and lots of adults meet their SOs through work, as that's the easiest way to meet people. Red flags are not unheard of, they happen all the time. OP's friend here was dating either a faculty or a student, which is fine, but it is so dicey, you have to be very discreet until you get settled. OP's friend was the opposite. Not only did they share info about them with other students, they literally shared info that is so detrimental it will be a career stopper. Story 14. Gambling. This is an actually good answer. With the insane rise of sports betting, this would top the list for me if I were dating. People were joking that Warhammer makes you poor. I don't know if anyone's ever gotten whacked over Warhammer debts. Being in a state where we went from no casinos to a couple Indian-owned ones, to state-licensed legal ones, to allowing in-person sports betting, to now having online sports betting too, man, the number of people, particularly younger people, I see blowing a significant amount of their life and income on sports betting apps is nuts. I knew of almost no one with a gambling issue 20 years ago, and I personally witnessed a lot of issues now. Thankfully, I don't have the gene, does nothing for me. My father and wife will sit there all day pushing a button if I let them. 
I take it you're from New York too, and I agree. Gambling is everywhere, and I'm very concerned for younger people. It was just over the holidays when my younger cousin was showing me all of his bets. He doesn't just bet on every game, he bets on specific things to happen in the game, like a backup QB throwing a TD at some point. After he gets done showing me all of that, he pulls out his Lotto app and explains how he has $100 taken from his checking account automatically every week and the breakdown of the tickets he buys. And he's a relatively typical young man in New York State now. Yep, I know of many 20-somethings that bet like this. Parlays, prop bets, dozens of bets on a typical weekend. I mean, okay, I'm not into this, but I can see tossing a $10 wager on my team, or some other fun slash close game, but these guys do not have the money to waste, yet they do. It's just so easy and accessible now. Too much. I was even pretty okay with the on-site sports betting, at least you had to go there and go back to get any winnings. New York has gone too far in the gambling world, and they want to do more. At every stop along the way in New York, more and more people have gotten into gambling, who I'd never peg as the gambling type. People really feel it's harmless entertainment, but there's a ton of people who absolutely shouldn't go anywhere near a casino or sportsbook. For those people, it really does go from harmless entertainment to total addiction pretty quick, and having ready access to casinos and apps just makes it more likely they'll keep losing money. It's very different when you have to drive to the middle of nowhere upstate versus going to one of the racetracks near New York City versus having it on every street corner. I grew up near Buffalo, and when the Indian casinos opened up, it kind of felt like this was the tribe's ultimate revenge for a whole bunch of bad stuff, and it seemed okay. Now it's just all going into the pockets of MGM slash resorts and Caesars. Story 15. Astrology. I've learned to accept it in my social circle of friends. The reality of life is that, if you look too hard at the truth of science and fact, it makes people so uneasy that for a lot of people it's really best to deny the reality of our situation for the time being and enjoy life while we can. I'm in a state of deep acceptance that we're screwed very soon, and I tell my friends that I don't believe in astrology, but will gladly talk with them about it. Honestly, astrology gives some people a way to make goals and to be hopeful, and to not get stuck in thought loops of despair. It's one of the most attractive leaps of faith belief systems out there because, let's face it, not everyone has the fortitude to believe in nothing and still go about their days without letting it get to their mental health. And it's usually better and less manipulative than organized religions or a cult. A crazy world leads some people to go to crazy lengths to find meaning. And if astrology is that thing, I'm not going to judge them or expunge them from my life. Usually they're pretty chill people. I don't care if they use it for introspection, but anyone that uses it as a means to judge people they don't or hardly know, or buy into things regarding compatibility, or just in general to make assumptions about things or people or to excuse their actions, I don't want anything to do with. And I find it to be a very large percentage of the Into Astrology group, not so many people that are just interested in their monthly horoscope and that's it. That's all fine until they start gluing crystals to their steering wheel or trying to get rid of their kid's undiagnosed worsening cancer by aligning chakras, colloidal silver, or chamomile tea. Sometimes when people start to drift from reality, it makes them feel so good that they keep drifting as far away from it as possible. Enabling or supporting that can sometimes be harmful. Story 16. Met a girl on Hinge who legitimately collected adult toys, and she showed me them all. It was an experience. OMG, perfect story for here. My mother used to own her own business, and ran it primarily from our house. She hired a woman to come to work for us, but didn't actually really know her or meet her. She shows up to the house for the first time and she's wearing an overshirt with cartoon penises on it, holding a water bottle shaped like a penis. My mom didn't take this as any hint. She kept her on the team and she was with us for a few months. But if you think it ended with a shirt and a bottle, you'd be dead wrong. My mother had me go with her to her house because we needed to pick some stuff up. They were large structures for an event, so they needed to be loaded into the truck and taken back to the house. We walked inside the house and, OMG, penises everywhere. Penis plushies, penis porcelain knickknacks, penis blankets, penis paintings, and even a coffee table shaped like a cartoon penis. Her whole house was dedicated to penises. Even the windowsills in the back of the house were nothing but adult toys with a hutch filled with toys and other things. I've literally never seen anything like that in my life. Like where the hell do you get a coffee table with a cartoon penis on it? My mother did eventually fire her after a few months though. She was totally unreliable. 
The final straw was when she told my dad and me that she was going to go use the bathroom and then disappeared for three hours. She said she went out to Taco Bell. Yeah, right, so she was gone. Thanks for watching until the end. If you have a similar story to these, maybe not that last one, uh, please leave it in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, please leave us a like and subscribe. For more videos like this one right now, please stop by our channel. Thanks again, and see you next time!